We are going to be talking about some of the players that are going underdrafted and undervalued in best ball in 2022. I'm looking forward to doing it. And these are specifically running backs. And for people who know, listening to me and Zach on the podcast, we are usually zero RB guys. So trying to you know target these guys in the third, fourth, fifth round is an interesting turn of events. But I think that the the value is just so much and the upside of these players is so great that I thought we had to jump on a show and talk about them. So we're going to jump straight into it and we're going to look at Brees Hall, rookie with the New York Jets, drafted in 2022, coming into the league on underdog at the moment. His ADP is around 47 and over at the FFPC, it is actually 13 picks less at 34th uh, draft pick overall. So when we look at it, fourth round ADP on one side, just late second on the other but i think looking at Brees hall heading into this season there's just so much upside heading and i know he's michael carter to to work with but i'm all in on Brees hall we were talking about this before the nfl draft and we were doing our drafts before the draft itself and how much rookies increase in value as the off season goes on after the draft and then how much their value increases heading into the season and i think we're going to see him continue to, to creep up probably to that mid second round as camp reports and things like that continue to arise a little bit surprised at the difference in adp on both sites obviously underdog is 0.5 ppr and then it's full point ppr over at the ffpc so um a little bit of a gap there in value but how are you feeling about Brees hall heading into the season so for Brees hall i mean he's definitely a guy who you know you, you said you're all in on him I, I i was all in on him too coming into into the draft and then he got the draft capital that we expected him to see we knew he probably wasn't going to go in the first round but we thought that a very early second round pick was more than likely for for um you know a player of his caliber what he brings to the table uh and then he got that capital when he when he went to the jets so everything that we thought about Brees hall in terms of where he may go in the draft and how that may help us uh better value him for fantasy drafts i think unfolded perfectly from that perspective he's a he's a guy who is truly a, a do-it-all back in terms of you know rushing ability he had over 3900 rushing yards in college he had 50 rushing touchdowns and then he also has plenty of receiving upside as well we also know that he doesn't necessarily have to come off of the field on third downs uh because he can serve as a pass catching back as well so i really do like him in terms of being a potential value for um, the jets especially in those ffpc leagues where he is going a bit higher but it's a full ppr format um, the one question that I do have with Brees Hall a little bit that I think needs to be factored in just a, a bit is Michael Carter. Um, I know that he was, you know, a fourth round draft pick last year um, and, and Brees Hall was undoubtedly drafted to kind of replace Michael Carter a little bit. But Michael Carter was still pretty solid last year as a rookie, um, 147 carries, 639 yards, four touchdowns on the ground. 36 receptions for 325 yards on 55 targets. Uh, very, very good pass catching work. So I do think that perhaps a little bit, we need to kind of bake in the fact that Michael Carter may still see some passing down work, which could vulture some of that PPR upside that we like for Hall in those regards. But if, if we think that he has a chance to, you know, still see a 60% plus opportunity share, which I think is very much on the table for him, then you're going to have him in a Jets offense that's hopefully going to see some positive regression from from what was really just kind of a brutal 2021 season. Zach Wilson struggled mightily as a rookie. Uh, he had 2,300 yards, nine touchdowns, 11 interceptions. And then the Jets as a team were 28th in total points scored per game. They were averaging 18.2. So um, when I think about some of these other players on the Jets offense, not even just necessarily Brees Hall, but even guys like Garrett Wilson or Elijah Moore, I think of guys who were essentially, they're, they're, they're coming into an offense that was kind of really bottom of the league. And if we expect even a marginal improvement for this team overall, which I do a little bit, then I think that, you know, some of these outlooks for some of these players becomes a little bit more positive and we hope that they can kind of return the value that we're seeking here. Uh, Hall is being drafted as the 16th running back currently overall on FFPC leagues. We have him ranked as the running back eight. Uh, I mean, that suggests a steal, right? That suggests that we're getting a, a high end um, or, or mid the mid to low end, I guess, RB1 compared to where the field is drafting him, which is more of a mid um, RB2. So I, I like Hall here. I think that he has everything that we like in fantasy. 
um, dating back to the production profile in college at Iowa State. So I, I like him here as a value. I think that he's a, a very good pick, especially in those full PPR formats like we have on FFPC. And then obviously for underdog, uh, not to speak too much longer on this, but for underdog as well, um, in that half PPR setting, we know that running backs have a little bit more value, uh, even just as rushers. So, so to get him there uh, and essentially the end of the third round, beginning of the fourth round, I think is a nice pick as well. Yeah, and these guys we talk about today, I think, you know, if we're looking at, uh, you know, kind of a modified zero RB build, and if you are playing at underdog, for example, and you can start off with three run, three wide receivers, and then in the fourth round, potentially get Brees Hall there to be your your anchor piece, and we're going to see that with the other guys we talk about here. You did a brilliant job there hitting on the kind of concerns, you know, you have the quarterback, does he get better? Well, he's entering his second season. If a quarterback usually makes that jump, it's often in that second season starting in the NFL. So we have Zach Wilson there. I think this team is going to be fascinating this year because a bit like the Cincinnati Bengals, and I'm not going to compare them like for like, but you have young quarterback, you have young wide receivers, you have a lot of young talent on a roster like that, and that can really change the fortunes of a roster in very, very quick time. So you mentioned Michael Carter, and there is the concern that he would split work with Hall, but, you know, it is 2022 running backs aren't going to just you know have 500 carries in a season unless you're Derrick Henry so they are going to need to split this work somehow um, and I do think this offense is going to be better I think a lot of people are thinking oh it's the New York Jets I think this going to be a more explosive offense which is going to lead to more green zone and red zone opportunities for the running backs and I think that's going to be very good for Brees Hall the next guy that we have on the list is Travis Etienne and he's coming back from an injury so he's heading into his second season but technically hasn't really ever played a down in the nfl heading into last season prior to the injury everything was you know very positive for him he had joined in there with his quarterback from college and trevor lawrence there was a lot of excitement like i'm saying with the jets with these young players coming in but the situation with Ardman meyer and the jaguars really did not work out in 2021 and travis Etienne was joking earlier this offseason in an interview if he was going to miss a season that might have been the, <laughs> the season to miss so um he is back seems to be on a, a road to recovery but the interesting things with him is this offense can't really get worse you mentioned the jets been one of the worst offenses in the league the jaguars were an absolute train wreck last year so he is coming in we should see a little bit hopefully of an improvement from trevor lawrence he is somebody who i have thought is a, a generational prospect the best probably quarterback coming in since Andrew Luck. So it didn't look that way last year, but I think things will improve this season. So we have that there whole situation. He's coming back also with an injury. So I think we're getting an injury discount here. We're getting the fact that he's playing for the Jaguars as a discount. And then when we look at injuries on this roster, James Robinson also got injured very late last season with a very serious injury. They're, you know, there's a chance that he won't be 100% healthy entering the season. They also did draft a Snoop Connor in the draft, which, you know, I don't think it's really going to eat into ETN's work. Pardon the almost uh, you know wordplay there, but I think uh, he is just set up for such a good role this season as a pass catching running back. I think he can really do it all. And kind of a lot of the stuff we talked about with Hall, I think we can see ETN fit into that mold as well. He is going an underdog in the late fourth round at pick fifty six, and then over at the FFPC going almost a full round earlier at um, the forty sixth pick overall, the late third round. So. You mentioned the difference in positional ADP for Brees Hall versus where we have him ranked. He is going off the board at the moment at the 23rd running back. And over at rotaviz.com, we have him ranked as the 16th running back in terms of positions with seven pick difference. So getting a, a nice value there as well. What are some of your thoughts? Are you as positive on ETN heading into the season as, as I am? Uh, yeah, I, I am. I, I like ETN a lot. I, I believe I remember this correctly, and I, I, I could be wrong, but I think in some discussions I had with Sean uh, last year, he kind of in some ways comped what we may be able to expect from ETN is something similar to Alvin Kamara. It's just that guy who is a very good pass catcher. We saw that during his time at Clemson, especially over the last two seasons where he had 37 catches in 2019, 48 catches in 2020. And then on top of that, just very good uh, rushing production and volume to go with that. He averaged for his career over seven yards per carry. Uh, in three of his final four se- or in three of his four seasons, he had over 200 carries. Like he he's kind of a legitimate looking bell cow back. I think I think is probably 
the phrasing I would put to it. He had a four four five forty. He had two hundred fifteen pounds of of weight. Like I mean, between the production and what we saw there um, from him, dur- or between the size and the production that we saw from him at Clemson, I think that ETN was a very good value in drafts last year. And then unfortunately, he had that torn ACL and and he went down, and, and that was kind of it. But you mentioned Lawrence being that generational quarterback prospect. Like if we truly believe that that's the case, then I think that ETN is a tremendous value. I think that. I think Lawrence himself could be a tremendous value. Like he was not good last year. Everything that could go wrong for the Jaguars went wrong uh, in 2021. And then some things went wrong after that. It was literally just like, it was, it was literally one of the worst possible scenarios you probably could have ever um, had for a couple of essentially star players. We hope star players entering their first year in the league, just with the ETN injury. And then also Lawrence just trying to navigate his way through a very defunct Jaguars organization and coaching staff. Uh, with Urban Meyer, of course, at the top of that to lead things off. They were last in points per game. Uh, Lawrence was another, another rookie, 12 touchdowns, 17 interceptions, 3,600 yards. Um, so, so again, if, if we're talking about players who we think are being discounted because of previously bad situations, because of a previously bad season, in the same way I kind of plugged Zach Wilson in the Jets offense, I think you have to apply the same – rules of of logic to uh, this Jaguars offense with with Trevor Lawrence coming in like if he's that truly generational prospect we could be looking at a guy who um, is is probably being draft being drafted far below what he may actually end up returning in terms of, of fantasy points by the time the 2022 season has come to an end and if we know that ETN is going to be a part of that um, potentially a big part of it, as you mentioned, James Robinson uh, with the torn Achilles late in the season. I think that Etienne is probably going to slide into a very significant work share early. And then if he shines, I mean, may- maybe he just kind of holds on to that, even if James Robinson, you know, eventually does return. Maybe Etienne is just so good early on that they they have no choice but to really only take him off the field uh, on downs where he needs a breather or something of that nature. So Etienne, I think, is a really, really good value here. Uh, like you said, currently the the RB23 on FFPC leagues, I, I think he's, you know, kind of that slam dunk pick this year that we hoped he was going to be last year. Now we just need to hope he stays healthy. Yeah, no, I feel the same way. And when we look through then some of the players going around the range, so I mentioned it, we talked about Brees Hall. Brees Hall is going then the likes of Cam Akers, David Montgomery, Antonio Gibson, Ezekiel Elliott, Josh Jacobs. They're the running backs going between Brees Hall, Travis Etienne and then who we're going to talk about next to is J.K. Dobbins but when we look through those options and we're looking at the running backs that are available there anyone familiar with our content with Rotoviz content Rotoviz radio podcast we do like to go for those younger players and try and see the op- upside what could come with their careers so the same as Brees Hall going in there and the same as J.K. Dobbins who we'll touch in a minute or Travis Etienne the upside of the youth element of it so we know that we know what david montgomery is we kind of at this point there's still a little bit of a chance we don't know what antonio gibson is but it hasn't been what we probably hoped maybe two or three years ago but um you know there's a lot of players in there like josh jacobs um ezekiel elliott that you want to be taking these younger guys over as well yeah and i I think too if, if we just walk real quickly through those guys who you mentioned we can probably tell ourselves something that's truly negative about drafting into our teams um, that I think is harder to tell ourselves about ETN. So we go to David Montgomery, potentially a horrible offense. Also, you know, getting older relative to ETN. He's been in the league for, I think this is his fourth or fifth season now. So David Montgomery has that going against him. Antonio Gibson, as much as I like him, the commanders, they did draft a running back in the third round, who I think could potentially eat into some of his green zone work, his short yard situations. Uh, Ron Rivera has kind of already suggested as much that he's looking to do kind of a Jonathan Stewart, D'Angelo Williams thing from back in the day. Uh, Ezekiel Elliott, I think Tony Pollard is just kind of waiting around to to get his opportunity to potentially take over as as maybe even that early down back. Uh, and then I think that Tony Pollard also has a pass catching upside that we saw last season. I think that that may grow again in 2022. Uh, Josh Jacobs, the Raiders chose to not extend him on his fifth year option. So he's a potential free agent heading into next season, assuming that they don't resign him before free agency hits. Uh, that's not great. Maybe maybe they try to test out some of their backs. They did draft Zamir White out of Georgia, who I think could eventually work his way into some touches as well. And then you get down there to ETN. 
um, where, where you're just kind of like, okay, like what's the situation here? James Robinson behind him injured. Snoop, Snoop Connor, fifth round running back. Oh, and by the way, Etienne doesn't just run well. He catches the ball well and he can catch a lot. Also, he can get a lot of catches on a Jaguars team that's still trailing by a lot. That's that's playing a lot of garbage time and simply needs to throw, which I think needs to be factored into um, his receiving upside also. Not only is he a good receiving back, but he could be a good receiving back on a team that's still relatively bad. It's, it's not like they didn't just pick first overall uh, a month ago. Yeah, no, that's 100%. And the other thing, again, we can do that with Hall and Etienne, is the kind of yeah. the Andre Swift workload that we've seen last year where they, the Lions were losing every single week, but Hawkinson and particularly Swift were getting the, the fourth quarter was just a gold zone for them in terms yeah. of PPR. So that is something really to factor in, particularly in full PPR, but even in those half-point PPR leagues like Underdog as well. The last player I want to talk about, and this is somebody who's really on the – line for me i think that he is a value you think that there may be some questions and you've done some very interesting work over at nbc sports edge this week looking at russian quarterbacks and the effect that they have on their running backs that is jk dobbins who is going as uh at adp of 51 on underdog that's in the fourth round and then 42 over at the ffpc kind of the mid third round for him so what are some of your thoughts? I, I'm very, very high. I'll openly admit on J.K. Dobbins heading into the season, but um, the piece that that you did this week um, provided some food for thought. Yeah, so the the piece I did over on NBC Sports Edge took a look at high volume rushing quarterbacks and the effects that, that they have on the running backs that they play with. Uh, I used data actually from the Rotoviz screener dating back to 2000 when the screener starts, and I went through and I looked at quarterbacks who had a minimum of 12 games played in any season a minimum of 14 pass attempts per game, which for those who don't know, a quarterback to be considered as a qualifier for passing statistics needs to average 14 pass attempts per game. That's the reason for that. And then quarterbacks who average 6.0 rush attempts per game, which over a full season amounts to, to just the under, I believe, uh, 100 rush attempts um, per season. So we know that's legitimately high volume there. So I went back, I looked at that. There were 37 total seasons in which a quarterback met these qualifiers. Um, a lot of them unsurprisingly have come since 2018 um, with, with guys like, you know, Kyler Murray, Lamar Jackson, obviously um, Josh Allen, another big one. And then Jalen Hurts this past season as a starter for the Eagles. He also fell into that category. So um, part of my article that I looked at was um, how, how running backs are scoring, not just in terms of fantasy points per game, but then how many of them are also simply returning top 24 value in points per game using PPR scoring, and then also top 12 um, in, in points per game, how, the, how, they're fact, how they're scoring with these high-volume rushing quarterbacks. And what I found was that since 2000, um, of running backs who have played with these high-volume rushing quarterbacks, only 51.4% of them have turned in a top 24 points per game season. And then only 24.3% of them have turned in a top 12, uh, you know, an RB1 season in terms of points per game. So when we're looking at that, and then when we're looking at someone, we're looking at someone like J.K. Dobbins, who's currently going around running back 21 on FFPC, I think there's some thought that people are drafting him, hoping that he's kind of a value, that they're, they're, they're drafting him, hoping that, you know, he he's a guy who the, the market is incorrect on, and they're hoping that, what they'll end up actually getting isn't a guy who's producing as this low end RB two that he's being drafted as. They're going to hope that he's being drafted or that he's going to return value more so as a uh, as a maybe a low end RB one or better in this in this Baltimore Ravens offense that we expect to be very high in uh, you know overall rush rate. They'll probably lead the league in rush rate again, especially after they trade away Marquise Brown and didn't draft the wide receiver. Um, they brought in a couple of undrafted free agents who will probably, you know, periodically see the field. But in all, I think this Ravens offense is going to be a high volume rushing attack. So um, I think we kind of maybe are going to be set up to be tricked into thinking that Dobbins is being underrated by the market as a low end RB uh, two, and that there's a possibility based on these numbers dating back over the last, you know, 20, 22 seasons that that it may not necessarily be on the table for a guy like Dobbins to be that sneaky RB one that we hope we're stealing a little bit later in our draft. So definitely, you know, head on over and, and check out the rest of my article. Like I said, it's on NBC sports edge. I'll actually be doing a, um, another article next week where we look at running or wide receivers and tight ends and how running, running quarterbacks are affecting them. But I thought it was an interesting find when, when we see that almost half of the running backs being drafted with these high volume rushing quarterbacks aren't even giving us top 24 seasons in terms of points per game. So Dobbins may be a value, but, but we have some, some historical data that suggests it may not be as great as we want it to be. 
Yeah, uh, it was very interesting to read through it. I would recommend the listeners check that out. But I'm still going to be drafting J.K. Dobbins in terms of positional ADP, uh, where he's going at the moment is RB21. Rotoviz.com rankings have him at number 11 at running back position. So that is 10 of a difference, which I think even if you go in and you draft him and he's like, you know, a mid RB2 and, you know, finishes as RB16, we're still in a pretty good spot there. But very, very interesting stuff to, to read from Zach. Yeah, and I think too, like you know, we, we shouldn't we shouldn't overlook what J.K. Dobbins did as a rookie because as a, if if a running back like this um, in this offense playing with a quarterback like this is to succeed, you're going to expect that he's going to succeed somewhat on efficiency. Um, and J.K. Dobbins had a very efficient rookie season when he finally had a chance to play. He was 37th in total opportunities. Um, he was 33rd in rush attempts, 51st in targets. But then we see that he was first in yards per carry. I think it was something crazy like 6.0 yards per carry. That'll come down, but he was still efficient and and could be efficient again this upcoming season. And then even though he was 33rd in carries, he was 16th in rush yards. Um, he was 16th in total touchdowns. And he was actually 7th in fantasy points over expectation per game. So uh, the upside to Dobbins, I would say, is we know he was highly efficient in his rookie season with Lamar Jackson. Uh, we, we kind of think that maybe there's a possibility possibility that that efficiency is somewhat sustainable where he can still give us a, a, a rb1 season um uh, which which i think needs to also be talked about i know that my article lays out what i what i think is some pretty good data on why we maybe shouldn't be as high on him but i think also if you just break down his 2020 season as a rookie the efficiency that we see from him is also enough to suggest that where we have him ranked on Rotoviz as running back 11 is very much within his range of outcomes as well. I think it's a very wide range um, when, when I compare everything I found in my article to what he did last season as a, or in 2020 as a rookie. Yeah, and I think, again, fitting in with Brees Hall and Travis Etienne, the youth of the player, even though he was injured last season, I think that injury discount is built into his current ADP. But, yeah, I think I always said that 2021, when he was drafted, he was <laughs> drafted in 2020. I always said 2021 was going to be when he would get – his you know real breakout obviously that didn't happen because he was injured but let's go for for 2022 but that's going to wrap up us talking about those players who i think are extreme values we're on the fence about jk dobbins but i think i'm on one side of the fence and, and zach might be on the other but <laughs> let us know what you think of that 